Welcome back to the podcast. On today's episode, I'm going to be sharing with you what to do if you're feeling blocked from your intuition. And the reason I'm sharing this is because I've really been guided to bring front and center some of the conversations and topics that I've been covering in my private sessions with the people who are going through my Becoming the Channel mentoring program. That's a year long private mentoring program on learning how to attract, receive, hold wealth on all levels for prosperity across the board. And um, listen, the people who are enrolled in that program are intuitive and intelligent leaders in their own right. They are the way showers, the messengers, and the thought leaders. And they are coming to me already successful in their own right. All of them have great followings in social media. All of them have successful business. They're six and seven and plus business owners in their own right. And they are feeling called really to dive deep into channeling wealth consciousness, which is why obviously they're stepping into these programs. But here's the thing that is coming up for them as, as they're discovering or actually rediscovering how to channel wealth consciousness is that there are some blocks to their intuition. Some of them are old things that maybe they've dealt with in the past. Some of them are new, new awarenesses. And to be honest, some of them even come from my own life because as, as I move deeper into mentoring in the Becoming the Channel programs, I'm moving deeper into my understanding of what it means to be a channel, what it means to channel wealth consciousness, and what are the things that are out of alignment with, ch with channeling wealth consciousness as well. So kind of the, the topic today is the major question is I'm feeling blocked. I'm feeling blocked. And what do I do about it? And how do I fix this? And so that's what we're going to tackle today. Ready? Are you ready? Let's dive in. Um, so I'll say a couple of things when I'm, I'll call it diagnosing blocks to intuition. One of the first things I have to take a look at is we're just reminding me and the person that I'm talking to that this is not actually a problem. And it's not something that needs to be fixed. I always want to conceptualize something like a block as an invitation, an invitation to dive deeper into your inner knowing an invitation to examine some old beliefs that you might be still holding, an invitation to examine your environment, to see what's going on in the environment that might be contributing to, to some interference between you and you, between you and your most deeply held intuitions, between you and your connection with divine source energy. Some of those are internal perceptions, certainly, and some of them are external as well. So we'll cover both of those today. So when I start looking at blocks, I always like to start with the psychology of blocks to intuition. I think that that's just an obvious place for me to start given my background. So we have to look at things like trauma, grief, ADHD, and we have to look at intellectual blocks as well. Here's the thing especially if you're drawn to my work, chances are quite good that not only are you very intuitive, you're also probably very smart. You're probably identified as gifted as a kid, or if you weren't, you're probably tested for gifted and something went sideways in the testing and it came back above average, but not quite at the level where you could be channeled into a gifted program. When we look at intelligence though, we look at the primacy of the intellect, the primacy of logic over intuition. And we can have some pretty significant intellectual blocks to our intuition. Things like perfectionism, not wanting to get it wrong. Things like performance, feeling like you have to perform. And if you don't perform or if you don't do it right, that you might be embarrassed or ashamed by your performance or that you might be letting somebody down. Another intellectual block is the block around feeling too well adjusted for your own good, meaning that you can contort yourself and shift yourself into the version of yourself that other people want you to be so that they can feel comfortable or think that you should be so that they can feel comfortable. 
And because you have such a vast intellect, in other words, you figure things out quickly, make sense of things and know what to do about them, you can just deploy your intellectual resources to creating the persona that is being called for in the particular situation that you're in to the point where sometimes you even forget exactly who you are. You become such a chameleon. And that's a, that's a major block to intuition, actually. It's like you have to ask the question of what am I channeling anyway? Am I even channeling my own intuition or am I channeling the projections, the hopes, dreams, desires, wants, needs of other people? And if I'm too well adjusted for my own good, chances are quite good that I'm going to be channeling somebody else's agenda rather than staying true to my own values, my own vision, and my own flow. We have to, when we're talking about trauma, I like to kind of break that down as well, because one of the things that can happen when you experience trauma, and these can be major traumas, and they can be micro traumas be a series of things that happen over the course of your career. I do, I help a lot of people who come out of corporate with what I call corporate trauma, which is just the kind of the essence of being in the corporate environment for as long as you are, things come up over the, over the period of your career, which create the conditions for you to have to be mistrustful, have to be more guarded, have to protect your heart, protect your mind from the people around you out of concern, fear, um, and almost hypervigilance that you're be, going to be hijacked at any moment. And chances are actually quite good that you will be just because of your, how you've been interacting in that environment for as long as you have. So when we're looking at trauma, we have to look at the, um, the root cause of the trauma, which can be personal, definitely. There can also be a genetic, a generational, a society, societal and cultural influence along with that. The epigenetics of trauma are really interesting. I think it's something that we still have a lot of work to do in terms of understanding it and, and then ultimately clearing it. But um, trauma is one of those areas that creates a block to intuition. One of the things that Barb and I wrote about in Smart Girls in the 21st Century, the book that I wrote about 10 years ago, one of the things that we said was that smart girls, gifted women, create thorns and shells around our hearts. And often the thorns and shells are a result of that trauma that we've experienced. We protect our hearts from the world. But in protecting our hearts from the world, we actually create a disruption in the flow, in the channels to our higher self, to um, our connection with the creator and with all that is. So in order to be able to really truly channel these high frequencies that I'm talking about, like wealth consciousness, like joy, like radiance, like creativity, we have, uh, I believe, a responsibility to, to, to do the clearings around the trauma to the heart itself, physical trauma, but also mental, emotional, and psychological trauma as well. So those psychological blocks are something that I always assess when I start working with people. And I will say this, that I've worked with people in my company for literally years now. They stay with me, not because they're codependent, but because they just love to keep growing. As I grow, they grow with me. And there will be things that we address today that weren't obvious or even aware five years ago. So depending on the situations that you find yourself in, depending on the lessons that your soul is here to learn, to master, there are going to be things that come up during certain periods of your life as well. Turning a certain age can bring up some new questions, including existential questions that are another contributor actually to blocking intuition. When, you, when you're sitting in existential crisis, when you're wondering what's next, when you're wondering what's the point, when you're wondering what am I even supposed to be doing here, those are all existential types of questions that can create a conundrum in the heart space and in the and can create a disruption between you and your intuition. Grief is one I want to touch on briefly because grief is a funny one. It can be an old grief that comes up across the course of the lifetime that you just carry with you from something that happened in childhood, or they can be, it can be a fresh 
level of grief, something that has happened recently, the loss of a loved one, the end of a marriage, the end of an era with your work can create grief as well. So those are all kind of on the surface level. Those, those are all invitations to reconnecting with intuition, to diving deeper into your mission, vision, and purpose, and to committing to doing the deeper work that is being called for as you're on this transformational journey. We also need to look at things in, a, in our environment though too, because here's the thing that I've learned, especially in the last couple of years as we've gone through this, this great awakening and we're on the ascension path now is that there are a lot of external forces at work to encourage us, I'll say, sometimes force us, to be honest, force us to maintain the status quo. In fact, a lot of people are channeling the status quo. One of my friends said recently, she made this reference to channeling the matrix. And I was like, oh, that was a really good thing to say because what the status quo is, is the matrix. So if you find yourself just channeling the same thing over and over and over again, like you're on the gerbil wheel and you go get up, you go get dressed, you get your coffee, you get in your car, you drive to work, you do the same thing over and over and over again, you are channeling something. It just happens to be the status quo, aka the matrix. So we have to look at our environment when we're looking at understanding the origins or the roots of blocks to intuition. The environment are things like, what are you listening to on the radio? What are you watching on TV? Who are you surrounding yourself with? What kinds of people, what kinds of messages are you surrounding yourself with? What kind of environment are you steeping yourself in? Uh, several of my clients work in healthcare and medicine. And as intuitive as they are, as bright as they are, they, their calling is in the medical system and where they find themselves a lot is kind of toggling back and forth between the ascension pathway and the status quo. And I always talk about them being adjacent to the status quo because they do have in, in their work this sort of sense of anchoring in new light, new life into potentially pretty toxic conditions. Now, ultimately we want to extract people from the matrix. That's the intention here to reconnect them with the infinite field of possibilities to reconnect them with their sovereignty. And that journey takes a while. It can happen in a na nanosecond, but sometimes it takes a while. So when I think about, you know, the environmental conditions that you find yourself in, you're going to want to look at like, what are the things that I can do to minimize my contact with the matrix? What can I do to minimize my contract with con and contract actually with the matrix? Meaning that if I'm choosing to spend my time watching Netflix, which is coded with all kinds of subconscious messages, if I'm choosing to spend my time listening to Fox News or CNN or, you know, reading the New York Times or scrolling through e-entertainment network info on the Kardashians. If that's what I'm choosing my to spend my time doing, that's where my focus is attending. And if my focus is attending there, it cannot also attend to the higher levels of consciousness, where wealth consciousness resides, where my spirit relies. Re, uh, resides. And my spirit actually relies on my attention connecting into these higher frequencies of consciousness. So if I'm in an environment that is distracting, that is noisy, that is conflicted, that's confrontive, that's competitive, that's going to create some static in my field, some disruption in my field that's going to create a block between me and my intuition. We also want to look at your food, your nutrition, and your water intake as well. You know, all of the, everything that we channel has to run through this physical system that we live in, it has to run through our nervous system, and our digestive system, our bloodstream, our respiratory system. So if you're subsisting on, you know, potato chips and Diet Coke, 
or Krispy Kreme donuts and Snickers bars, chances are quite good you're going to have a mismatch between your physical body, the frequency of the physical body, and your capacity to channel these higher levels of consciousness. One of the things that I noticed as I really dove deeper into becoming the channel myself, I started the process long ago, I had this in inherent nature to be able to do this work, but to really consciously take responsibility for it happened probably five or six years ago, especially when I started studying the Akashic Records, training in the Akashic Records system, and then teaching it to other people. And what I noticed was that my body was automatically shape-shifting to accommodate more light and more life force. And in so doing, what I found is that it, my body wasn't really able to tolerate animal products for the most part. I'll still do eggs as a source of protein. I'll still do some cheeses because don't talk to me about my cheeses. I love my cheeses. <laughs> but in terms of the meat proteins, the beef, the pork, the, the chicken, um, those kinds of proteins just don't set well with my body. And so it wasn't even like a hard thing to do. I just stopped eating it one day. I just stopped. And I found other sources of proteins that work better for me, primarily uh, plant proteins. So we have to look at food and nutrition when you are on the becoming the channel pathway, because if you're still trying to maintain your nutritional needs based on the old paradigm of who you used to be before you stepped on to the becoming the channel pathway, the more challenging it is going to be for you to be able to stay connected with your higher source of consciousness, with the wealth consciousness that we're referring to here. And then also looking, so not just looking at nutrition and food, but also looking at the source of your water. The other thing that I've become really sensitive to is how much chlorine is in the water. I can like when I pour water from the tap into a water bottle to put it in my filtration system, I can smell the chlorine coming off of the water. I've become so sensitive to it. So I have, I use a Berkey water filter system. I filter, I drink all of my water through that system that clears out most of the, of the chemicals and impurities in the water that, um, that have been put there by design. Some of them intentionally like fluoride and fluoride, by the way, is a known blocker of the pineal gland. And the pineal gland, of course, is associated with the third eye, the, the inner vision. And so if, by the way, if your clairvoyance is a little bit off base, if you can't see in the dark, if you can't see using your inner vision, chances are pretty good that you're going to want to do some clearing around around the foods that you're eating, the water, the type of water that you're drinking, and even down to the toothpaste that you're using. I don't use fluoride toothpaste anymore. I use natural toothpaste. When I go to the dentist, they do roll their eyes a little bit, but I've trained them to not. Um, when I have my teeth polished, they don't use a fluoride polisher. They just use kind of a gritty sandy thing that that is perfectly safe and perfectly fine to use in order to polish my teeth as well. So I've gotten really sensitive about what I'm allowing to come into contact with my body. I'm not perfect by any means, but I continue to develop in that way. Recently, I was guided to get a new um, shower head for my shower that filters out a lot of the impurities as well. And that's really supportive, just my, my skin and my hair as I've been doing this work. So take a look at that if you're feeling blocked in your intuition, food, nutrition, and water, including the water that you're even putting your, on your body and your skin, looking at any harsh chemicals that you might be inadvertently still using, like the aluminum in deodorant or antiperspirant. I stopped using that years ago as well, just as a, another way to keep the chemicals out of my body, which creates a clearer channel for the energy to flow through. We also have to look at sleep and exercise. So if you're not getting enough sleep or if your sleep is disrupted, um, if you have early morning waking, if you've got busy brain and you can't get back to sleep after you wake up, those are all signals that there's something going on in the nervous system that needs to be attended to in order for you to feel better. Because we also know this, that unless and until you're feeling your best, 
the channel is going to be somewhat disrupted. There's going to be some static in your connection between you and wealth consciousness, between you and your creator. So when I look at sleep and disruption in sleep, I'll, I'm just going to tell you a couple of the things that work for me. I'm not making health recommendations at all. You need to you need to go through that process on your own and check with your healthcare professional if this is something that lands for you. But what has helped for me, I, I use a really high quality CBD oil that's specifically designed for sleep. So it's got, I think, Ashwanga in it as well and some other other natural products that are really supportive of managing the nervous system during the night so that you can get a good night's sleep. And I use a blend of reishi mushrooms for sleep as well. And then I use also electrolytes in my water and the electrolytes are really high, pure frequency electrolytes that really are supportive again of creating a, an open, clear space for the energy to flow through. So once you are moving in the direction of creating a clear channel, like literally creating a space for higher frequency energies to flow through, these are some of the things physically that you're going to want to take a look at. I've also, one of the things I didn't mention in terms of the psychological blocks, but I think it bears bringing forward here is burnout. So burnout is a cluster of symptoms that has to do with the neurophysiology, with your relationship with work, with your relationship with life, actually. And, and some people call it adrenal fatigue. I'm not sure that that's exactly accurate, but it's definitely just a, a cluster of symptoms that can create another disruption in the channel. So if you're feeling burned out, one of the things that has worked for me is an essential oils blend. It's called Motivate by doTERRA. And I don't sell doTERRA or anything like that. I don't get anything from telling you about it other than just to say it's one of the, it was one of the game changers for me early on as I was recovering from burnout during the, during the early phases of, of this work I've been doing for the last several years. So sleep and then exercise. If you're not exercising, actively moving your body, building muscle, creating a long, lean, integrated system for yourself, for, for your spirit to reside in, because your body is actually a sacred temple for your spirit to reside in. If you're not doing that, it's time to start. I'm not saying that you have to go out and lift heavy weights. That's something that does work for me. Um, I'm not saying that you have to have a six pack abs, although I think a lot of us appreciate that. Um, I have said in the last couple of years, I didn't used to know what I was training for. I, I've trained for years. I've had a personal trainer for years. And in the last couple of years, I've said, no, now I understand I'm a spiritual warrior and I'm really making my body as long and lean and as strong as possible for this work that I'm doing now. So we want to give our, our, our spirit the most aligned system to work in. And that most aligned system to work in is going to be strong and long and lean. Now, I know not everybody's body is that particular structure, but whatever your version of that is, the strongest, most supple, most high frequency version of yourself is the one that is going to be the purest channel for your, for your spirit to flow through. So look at exercise there as well. I have one of the things that can create disruptions actually to channeling to your intuition is when you wear electronics. So those Apple watches, I tried for a little while, one of those aura rings, just because I wanted to see what it was like to have bio data coming through. And I really liked the bio data. I did not like wearing the ring. So I'm wearing that very sparingly and I'm making a decision to do so. I'm putting some protections around that so that I'm so that the ring is working for me and not working for anybody else, including the matrix. I know that sounds a little weird, but hang with me, hang with me here because really the disruptions from the, from the, um, the electronics around us can create some problems with intuition as well. Um, the e EMF waves that come through our computers, our laptops, our phones, these are also, these can also be disruptors. I know that some people turn off their Wi-Fi at night. 
just to shut everything down for the night. And though I haven't tried that, I think it is something to take a look at in terms of just creating a, a pristine field around you. And then on an energetic level, we have to look at if you've got any brain fog or any kind of forgetfulness, disruptions in your thinking, zoning out, daydreaming, and not the good kind, but just kind of like zoning out, really. I guess that's the best way to say it. If you've got any of those, we need to look at the energetic hooks and cords and energetic entanglements that might be creating some disruption and distraction from what you're meant to be doing here, which is channeling the highest frequencies of love, light, and truth. So those things are the kind of in a nutshell, the things that I want to look at when people are saying that they're blocked around their intuition. Here's the other thing I will say. I've got to be in my bonnet about this, and it's not going to be a popular thing to hear me say this, but the general conversation, I think, in the light worker community, the, the 5D community, the Ascension community, is that everybody's intuitive. And I'm going to disagree with that. Not everybody is intuitive. Intuition runs on a normal distribution curve. So most people are going to be of average intuition. But then there are those of us who are on the tail of the curve, who are in about the 90th percentile and above on our intuition. We have an inherent ability to be intuitive. We don't have to be taught how to be intuitive. We might have, we might need support on opening up some channels if we're feeling blocked, but there's an inherent intuition that not everybody has access to. And I think that from where I'm sitting, we do the people like you and me a disservice when we say that everybody is intuitive. It's like, if everybody is intuitive, why does it matter if I'm channeling? Except not everybody can channel, just like not everybody can be a medium, just like not everybody has telepathy, just like not everybody can bilocate or can move objects with their minds or can levitate or can astral travel. Those are innate gifts that some people have been given, but not all people. And I share this with you because I think one block, especially if you've got a native intuition, you grew up seeing spirits when you were a kid or some, and sometimes scary things too. You grew up just with an inner knowing of something that was going to happen, good or bad, like I did, knowing when teacher was going to have a pop quiz or whatever it was. I just knew. And not everybody knew that. But when we say that everybody is intuitive, it actually does something. It kind of limits our ability to fully express ourselves because if everybody's intuitive, then why is this so easy for me? Then it should be as easy for everyone else as it is for me. And it's simply not. So one of the best ways to unblock your intuition, if you are feeling blocked, is to really take a look at what are the stories that I told myself as a kid, as a young person, or even right now around my intuition? And if I'm telling myself a lot of stories about how everybody can do it and everybody's intuitive, that may be the very reason that I'm feeling a little bit blocked around my intuition. And what if I just allowed myself to just be in my fullest potential as an intuitive being, as somebody who knows that they know that they know? How would life be different? How would I be different? What could I create then? And the other thing about clearing blocks to intuition is that you don't have to look at it as something to be fixed. You can just look at it as an invitation to step around it to one of my colleagues calls it out creating, just out create it. What's the solution to this? What's the workaround? What's the pathway through? And being in the question, wondering about that, being curious about the solutions is going to be, I think, far more productive and magical for you than trying to chip away at some of these blocks. Now, that doesn't mean don't pay attention if you've got trauma or grief or ADHD or burnout or any of those other kinds of experiences that we know creates interference or disruption from your intuition. But it does mean asking a question about what can I do differently? Or what's the best way to navigate this so that I can be in my fullest and highest potential?
And then the last thing I want to talk about today before we close is this. I don't want us to gaslight ourselves around being having our intuition blocked. Some of it is our own stuff. Some of it's things that we get to clear, that we get to address. There are genetic and generational, societal and cultural blocks to intuition. One of the things that I know for sure is that if you have a name change at any point in your life, whether it's making a decision to kind of shorthand your name, go by your initials or go by a part, a part of your name, or if you get married and change your, your surname to your partner's surname or add a hyphen, a hyphenation to your name, it changes the frequency of your entire being. It changes your numerology. It changes your relationship to creator, not necessarily even a bad way, but it does change it. So I remember when I was getting married to my college sweetheart, there was a lot of pressure for me to change my name. In fact, we got into an argument at our rehearsal on the altar about whether I was going to change my name or not. And I acquiesced because all of the eyes were on me. All of the eyes, the whole wedding party is watching Robin. What is she going to do here? Because everybody knew how strongly I felt about keeping my name. And I felt this immense pressure to change my name, which I chose to do, but it was very much under duress. And it really changed who I, how I showed up in the world. I'll just say that. So when I got divorced, the day that my divorce was final, May 3rd, 2002, I went to the driver's license place and I had my name changed on my driver's license. And from then on, I felt like myself again. But the years that I went by somebody else's last name, I didn't feel like myself. My numerology had changed. And not only that, but I also found myself taking on the stories of his family through that name, through that lineage, the money stories, the stories of success, of work, of how life is done, got taken on with this name. So it wasn't just the name that I attached myself to. It was all of the stories and all of the energetics behind it. So when you are doing this deeper work around dropping even further into your intuitive channel, it's really important to begin at the beginning. And the beginning is what name you were born with, what name you came in with. And even if that feels uncomfortable, if it doesn't feel like, like you anymore, it feels like somebody who's different from you, that's okay. But it's important to have a look at that. And that's some of the work that I've been doing with my clients. Just in the last week or so, this has come up around names. What do I call myself? When people talk about rebranding themselves, that's one of the things that, that comes up is, how, what do I want to call myself? What part of my name do I need to reclaim? lay claim to maybe for the first time. And I always love to tell the story. I really, I didn't like my name when I was a kid. I was mad at my mom because she named me Robin and then she spelled it with a Y, not an I. So I wasn't like anybody else. And everybody would have to, I'd have to correct everybody on how to spell my name. And then the story was that before I was born, my parents were going to name me Michelle. And I thought that was a fabulous name. And why didn't you name me that? I asked one day and my dad said, well, when you were born, you came out and you were very clearly a Robin. Like there was, he said, he described it as just me in my infant self being very insistent that my name was Robin. So it took me years to grow into my name and to grow to embody my name. My name, Robin, actually means bright and shining one. And I think now in, in my adulthood, how perfect that is for me. But as a kid, it just felt so big and bold and obvious. And I just wanted to fit in and I just wanted to be like everybody else. And so I would shorten it to Rob and my friends would call me, my, my dear friends in high school called me Bobby Lynn, which was so sweet and endearing, but it was certainly not my name. So we have to look at names as potential blocks to intuition. And then we also have to look at songs that might be blocking your highest potential. And this one 
comes up. Holy smokes. This one comes up just in a very recent understanding for myself that I want to share with you today. So I had made some decisions recently to hire some people to support me in my business. And something wasn't going as, as quickly as I had wanted it to go. And I had, I had hired somebody else to do this piece of the, of the work for me and it wasn't going as quickly and I wanted some additional visibility and it wasn't coming through. And, you know, I'm really, you guys need to know this. I'm on a mission to call in our soul family. So if you're here with me, you're part of the family, you're welcome at the table, you're welcome home. And I'm on a mission to call in all of us because now is the time to do that. And time is of the essence. So there really is a big purpose behind me wanting to be more visible on the national and international stages as well. And so I was really working through this and knowing that I hired the right person. So I knew it wasn't that, but I knew that there was something else going on. So yesterday, actually, I took a nap with the kind of the question on my, on my heart. When I take naps, I always ask the guides questions and things always come through during nap time. And this is no exception. So my question was something around what is the thing that is competing with my desire to be broadly visible on the international and national stages? And I fell asleep. And in the middle of my sleep, this song popped into my head from when I was a teenager. It's by Howard Jones. And I think it's called No One's to Blame. But it's this very wistful kind of lyrical song about how you're always going to be disappointed. So one of the lines that, and the first line that came through for me yesterday was, you're the fastest runner and you're not allowed to win. And I was like, I woke up from my nap with that in my, my mind. And I was like, oh my goodness, holy smokes. Just so you know, I ran track in high school and college. I ran on a track scholarship. I broke two school records in the 100 and the 200 on the same day in college. And I never won a race. Not ever once. Not ever once did I ever actually win a race. I'm going to take that back. I did win one race. And then there were a lot of repercussions for me winning that race. Okay. So. I tuned into what that was. And that was actually what they showed me was that that was a program that came into my consciousness at a very vulnerable time, a very um, time that my brain was shaping. And that I was trying to understand the world as a 14 or 15 year old kid. And um, you're the fastest runner and you're not allowed to win. And you have all of these aspirations, but you're always going to be disappointed. Your hopes go down the drain. It's really a dis despicable song if you think about it. It's horrifying, actually. Um, so I did some clearing around that. And I'm still, I'm curious to see what shifts as a result of me doing that clearing. But that was something that really stood out for me as a block, not necessarily to my intuition, but definitely to my highest potential that I had no conscious awareness of, which made me think about other songs that might be unconsciously creating a disruption between me and my highest potential, between my clients and their highest potential and be, between you and your highest potential, actually. So there's that song. There's the song from Annie, The Sun Will Come Out Tomorrow. I just saw Annie on Broadway production last weekend with my family. And I used to love that story. And then I sat there that night and I'm like, I've become so jaded in all of the messages that we receive and are just such catchy tunes. I sang the sun will come out tomorrow when I was in seventh grade for my music competition. Bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow there will be sun. It's always deferring your hope for tomorrow. It's always deferring optimism for tomorrow. It's always placing your focus and attention on a day that never actually arrives. It's, it's sending your attention into the future. Well, guess what? As a result of that, your point of power, your point of, of power is in the present moment. Your point of creation is in the present moment. So now we have to unpack that and reel us back into the present moment. No, the sun comes out now. 
The sun comes out in the now, not tomorrow. So that's another song I want you to just tune into and see if there's anything there for you. And then the last one is one that I've brought up before, but I think it's perfect here as well. My mom sang me the song when I was a little girl. I think it's by Doris Day, uh, Que Sera Sera. Whatever will be, will be. The future is not ours to see, Que Sera. Holy smokes. Can I just tell you how difficult that song is to think about and to understand what that did, what that was programmed to do for my inner vision? The future is not ours to see. We'll see. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. We have no control over that. I had a conversation with somebody recently and I said, you know, when you work with me in these, in these containers, like becoming the channel, you no longer get to say, you don't know what's going to happen. Now that doesn't mean that you have to micromanage and plan and white knuckle your way into the future but you get to be the deciding force and the conductor of the energy and the direction that the energy goes into your future. So you no longer get to abdicate the responsibility to somebody outside of yourself for how the future goes. And yet we have messages like that playing on in the backgrounds of our cars and the backgrounds of our minds for years on end. It is in any wonder that we feel a disruption between ourselves and the future. When the subconscious message is that the future's not ours to see. Que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. Mm -mm. I call bullshit on that. Especially if you're in this space and especially as if you view yourself as a creator, as a messenger, as a way shower, as a thought leader. Oh, hell no. But we have to do some deprogramming. We have to do some clearing. We have to do some shifting to extract those earworms from our language centers, from our receptive language centers, from our, from our auditory centers that are just playing on in the background. And that's what I mean, just to come back into the environment and how it can influence our relationship with our intuition through no conscious awareness of our own. We just have these things playing on in the background that have been imprinted on our memories. On, and then color our perception of the world. So songs, names, feeling blocked, all of these are the central focus of shifting into becoming the channel. Now you can think maybe there's a lot of work to do but really it's, it's in some ways an extraction process, isn't it? It's an awareness process. Because once you're aware of something, first of all, you can't unknow it. So I always say hashtag, sorry, not sorry. But the second thing is when you become aware of some of these influences, especially the unconscious influences, you can make a decision as a conscious co-creator to shift out of it. You can, you can shift, you can extract, and you can fill in the gaps with beautiful crystalline love, light, and truth that restore your connection with your higher self, with your creator, with the field of infinite possibilities, and with the field of sovereignty. So with that, I'm going to close for today. It's been my joy to be here with you. If you feel like it's time for us to work together, perhaps in the capacity of the Becoming the Channel one-on-one -on -one mentoring program, the best thing to do is to book a consult with me. And you can do that by going to drrobinmckay.com forward slash call and get on my schedule. And we'll have a conversation about that. Um, I have five spaces left in that private mentoring program, and those programs start at 20K, just FYI, not saying that other than I just want to give you that information. There are other ways that you can work with me as well. We have the Akashic Records level two and three coming up this spring. We have some retreats that we've got in the works as well. 
But I do want to encourage those of you who are feeling called to do some private work with me to reach out to me and get let's get connected to be able to get that started for you in the next week or two. All right. All right. Until next time, I will see you later.